All right. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. My name is Rupen. I'm your host in Anko Daily. And today I'm introducing our distinguished guest, Mr. Harut Semerjan. He's a visionary leader with a profound impact on healthcare and biotechnology industry. His educational journey started with an admission to the Lebanese American University, where he pursued a bachelor in science in biology. He furthered his education with an MBA from Cornell University, and then from an MBA from Queen's University in Canada. Mr. Semerjan's distinguished career includes 18 years at Novartis, most recently serving as head of the U.S. hematology business and the senior vice president and the global lunch lead of the CDK46 program and later contributing significantly to the Ipsen's global expansion as the chief commercial officer. Currently, he holds the position of president and the CEO of Glycomimetics a clinical stage U.S. biotech bringing invaluable experience to the table as the company advances its lead assets in acute myelogenous leukemia. Join us as we delve into the journey of Mr. Samir Jam, uncovering insights and wisdom that have shaped the healthcare landscape on the global scale. Stay tuned for enlightening conversation with Mr. Samir Jam. Welcome, Mr. Samir Jam. I'm so happy to have you today here. Thank you, Rupen. And please call me Harut. Thank you so much. Can we start by bits about you? I I, I, I I want to understand more about you. What inspired you to pursue a career in this field? And were there any pivotal moments or mentors who guided you along the way? Yeah, no, th thanks for that question. And um, I mean, uh, maybe, maybe to start with disappointing you, there, there wasn't like this big master plan you know, 30 years uh, in the making where it was all about, you know, all the premedicated steps were were clear. Um, I loved sciences. I loved biological sciences. And that's what I went to university to study. Um, at the same time, I knew I did not want to go to medical school and spend, you know, 10 years of my life studying. I wanted to go out, explore the world, which was kind of a challenge because pretty much all my classmates were there with a very clear vision of wanting to go into medical school next after they finished their undergrad. So it was kind of a um, complex time for me. It's like, okay, I like the science, but what am I gonna do afterwards? And, uh, and it was really serendipitous because um, I was asking people as I was graduating, you know, people who I thought were, were you know, fairly uh, doing well in the community, prominent members, and I stumbled across a gentleman who was a neighbor of ours, and um, he, he, you know, he mentioned he's in pharmaceutical sales, which he turned out to be a career pharma salesperson. And then I asked him if I can shadow him for a day to further understand what he does. And actually, he was kind enough to, you know, ask his district manager, and they allowed it. And you know, I actually accompanied him to one of the local hospitals, uh, Hotel Dieu de France, in, in Beirut. And uh, I really fell in love with what what the domain is. I mean, I went from not knowing anything about it on a Monday to to a Friday saying this is what I want to do. So that's kind of how I started in pharma and never look back um, across across con countries and continents uh, as well. So that was the start. Amazing. Let's go back to the early 2000s. You've achieved a lot and became the vice president at Novartis. How did you grow in the company and eventually contribute to the company's achievement of generating profits exceeding three billion dollars? Yeah, no. Look, I, I was I was very fortunate to spend eighteen years in in, in Novartis. Uh, I actually, even joined Sandoz before the the merger um, as a as a transplantation um, sales representative. So you know, starting off from sales and then graduating, as as you mentioned, uh, I was the head of uh, the hematology business in the U.S. and then became the SVP and the head of the CDK46 inhibitor program, um, which which is really you know very interesting. So the vast majority of that 18 years was spent in oncology and hematology, and and very fortunate to have worked with some amazing people and learned learned a lot. Um, you know, the common thread is really being open to additional challenges and, 
And I remember roles where, you know, if I was offered because I was solving one issue and then you get offered something else. Oh, we have, you know, this this challenge in, in this area. Would you be interested? And, you know, for me, as my wife always reminds me, is like I say yes before knowing exactly how to figure it out. Like, yes, I'll do that. It's interesting. And then, you know, kind of go back and try to figure out, okay, how are we going to tackle this issue? Um, how are we going to kind of decipher the multiple uh, issues that it has into different pieces? And how can we unknot the tie one at a time? Um, I, I guess that that passion and skill set uh, has been seen as valuable. And that's kind of how I you know, rapidly rose in the ranks of, of Novartis, I would say. Amazing. And... Can we discuss with your role at Ipsum? You successfully transitioned roles and uh, spread the growth across Europe, Latin America, the Middle East, and Asia. Could you share insights on how you positioned the company in the global market? Yeah, it was, I mean, after 20 plus years in large, large pharma, um, you know, I wanted to do something a bit different as well. And, um, and you know, being of Armenian and Lebanese background um, and having been in North America for, for many, many years. Um, and um, uh, it, it was one of those where a European mid-sized company wants to further expand and, and professionalize uh, their, their footprint. And they had you know, just hired their first uh, um, you know, non-French CEO at the time. Uh, with the idea and agenda of you know further pursuing innovation and building upon the the great work that had happened in the past. So I kind of had two roles uh, there. One was operationally, I was responsible for all countries outside of the U.S. from an mm -hmm. operational mm -hmm. excellence perspective. But also the second strategic role was really setting up a global organization that's ready to be able to launch and you know multiple assets one after the other especially in oncology and hematology um and that was something of more of a transformational can you do that at scale can you do that consistently across the world uh the company had bought different businesses and kind of was a a uh, you know different ways of how business was done across the world so that was another area so those were the two things and it was uh, it was a lot of fun uh, i have to say I met a lot of amazing people um and uh, you know and and three years uh, very well spent uh, and i'm in touch with many of the folks who you know you become friends as well after a period of time of ups and downs and and all that so so that was that was a very uh, cool cool role as well Amazing. So let's now transition and talk about glycomimetics. Could you explain in simple terms, what is the distinction between pharmaceutical and biotechnology industries? Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm the right person to, to you know, explain that. There are books written on this, uh, Rupin, but uh, I mean, broadly speaking, uh, these used to be kind of... Uh, similar but different so you know it started from uh biotechnology was really you know what it says bio and technology so using technology based on living organisms to produce uh, uh therapies uh, you, you know that come through what became the biologics right and then mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals were traditionally more known as uh companies that are more chemistry based they're they're synthesizing uh you know um uh, therapies out of, you know in the lab um, so that's kind of where generally it, it started, but over the years, it's it's just kind of have been kind of overlapping quite a bit. And then you have another term, which is the biopharmaceuticals. You know? Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, they, they, typically what, what I see currently in the marketplace, you know, biotechs in healthcare are typically seen as the smaller companies that have a platform. They are working on their first asset. The mm -hmm. vast majority of them have, don't even have a commercialized drug yet. Uh, that's kind of what biotechs are mostly, you know, kind of if you say the word biotech, that, that's what's come to mind. While you say the word, you know, pharmaceuticals, it's the more established, you know, companies like a and j and a Novartis and, and all that that have been going on. Although one can argue a lot of the uh, large assets that, that pharma has is a biotech, you know, is a biologic. Uh, so I think there's a lot of uh, overlap, but uh, at the same time, there are some very clear distinction with with very different 
challenges as well. Mm -hmm. um, take funding as an example. You know, yeah, 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 exactly. Twenty-five years in pharma, I really didn't have to worry about you know funding. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> I did not have to go out and raise uh, capital for Novartis. I'm sure you know my bosses had to do that, but I didn't have to do that. Here, you know, in a biotech, um, thinking about uh, cash runway, thinking about you know making really tough choices is really a daily living, uh, much more than anywhere else I've ever had that experience. So there are similarities, but there are also differences. And 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 these days, uh, people use the word interchangeably, but generally that's kind of how how it's been defined, as I was mentioning. Oh yeah, I completely agree with you. Uh, I think also when it comes to like uh, health tech startups. And healthcare startups, I think the most challenging journey lies in front of biotech companies. So, like kudos to what they are doing. It's like it's 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 there are tons of challenges, and it's not easy at all. Yeah, I mean, one statistic that I learned in in the university, I mean, when I was in in, in Cornell, is the vast majority of companies fail because uh, it's not because they have a bad idea; they just run out of cash. You know, and I yes. really didn't appreciate this. <laughs> Uh, and that's kind of where uh, I see it every day. Unfortunately, you see, especially in the in the last couple of years, where the market for biotechs has been, you know, let's say brutal uh, from exactly. a, from you know funding perspective. But still, it's it's you know we're I mean I'm excited about our journey where where we uh, got ourselves, which I'm sure we're gonna get into. But uh, yeah, generally for the environment, it's been uh, it's definitely not uh, in the heydays as it was a few years ago, which I hear about. Uh, you know, people talk about it fondly. Yeah, I agree. So we we, we touched about glycomimetics, uh, but now can you explain like what are the glycobiology-based therapies? Could you provide our audience with an overview of what are the company's mission and its significant contribution to the healthcare and biotech sector? Yeah, I mean, so when I was uh, when I was looking at um, at what do I want to do next, you know, I, I was in big pharma for many years, medium sized, and really, you know, I'm fortunate enough my life in my life to to be able to take you know more risks as well, uh, in terms of uh, you know being in a in a much smaller biotech without any commercial drug yet. Um, and when I was looking at different uh, you know platforms or of, of innovation. This area of glycobiology really caught my eye, and um, and I, I, to, I, to be honest, I had no idea what what it is because typically, uh, what's in the limelight, what we pursue a lot is is really the, um, the you know from a molecular biology perspective, perspective is the pursuit of, of protein synthesis, right? Mm -hmm, uh, you know, mm -hmm, DNA, mm -hmm. RNA, proteins, and 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 there is a very good pre-structured. Uh, uh, template for how you know precisely exactly that, that is, exactly that is yes. Created. But then you know you step back and you look at you know I I, I saw a few different presentations where, uh, and one of them by actually by Carolyn Bartozzi who who is a leader in this uh, area of glycobiology and and she was one of the uh, Nobel Prize winners last year. Wow! Um, and uh, and it's really it was all about you know talking about the complexity of uh, higher organisms like humans, uh, while their genetic uh, composition is not too much more complex than some of the simpler you know, you know organisms and uh, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. arguing that a lot of that is because of the addition of carbohydrates on top of these proteins and, and on cell surfaces that really mm -hmm. explodes the the complexity of um, of, of uh, you know human cells and I was really fascinated by that um, you know uh, aspect and 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 glycobiology in a very simple term is the science of sugars. Is really the synthesis and you know knowing that um, uh, you know carbohydrates on cell surfaces have a role to play in terms of cell recognition uh, mm -hmm. communication. So uh, when when I met the, um, the the management and the board of Glycometics, that was an interesting conversation in terms of is it is it maybe time to bring a therapy forward. Uh, in the real world, based on a pure glycobiology, you know, made uh, um, uh, platform, and that's when that's where I was very interested in, in you know, kind of being part of that um, early pioneers and joining a company that has been pioneering this area of glycobiology for for a long time. So it's really, in a way, 
it it complements these you know the, the what we know on protein uh, synthesis and that role by really expanding um, you know the field into into the, the the sugars on top of that and the the carbohydrates and their role in um, in the body. So that's that's what um, you know. If I, I don't know if I did it justice, but uh, that's kind of what I was excited about uh, about the joining a company that's glycobiology based uh, platform. No, I agree with you. I, it, it does make sense. There is lots of emphasis, as you said, like on genetics and DNA and RNA. And I, I do agree that the cell structure is much more complex than that. And lots of therapies that we use today target receptors and target specific proteins. And sugar is part of this receptor, part of this protein, and developing things that can target specifically the things that we haven't been thinking about it's crucial. I, I think there's also like lots of uh, um, pressure and or maybe lots of research about DNA and RNA and the glycobiology hasn't been entertained enough. And I think it's the time to start thinking more about it. I completely agree with that. Yeah, it is complex. It is. It it has seen a lot of you know uh, uh, setbacks, and but I mean that's science, right? I mean that's it's never a straight line to 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 go up. And and in a way where like, I get excited about you know as one of my mentors would would say, if everybody's going south, you need to go north. You exactly. Know? So, you know now obesity you know assets are um, you know all, all the rage, and you know I, I heard the figure the other day where how many new companies are forming in this area, how much, you know, investment is going into this area. Years ago, it wasn't the PD-1, pd one And and that's and that's okay. I mean, that's needed. It, it just, uh, what motivates me is actually saying, okay, what is what is different? What is new? Can What's we unique? figure it out? Are there some ways that we can actually bring it forward? And and if it works, I mean, you're literally opening a whole new paradigm in, uh, in the field of, uh, of biology and understanding... Uh, you know, uh, how can we help more patients uh, through uh, different ways while a lot of the science continues, but also new approaches are needed, especially in some diseases where there hasn't been that much, you know, uh, improvements as well, um, such as, you know, relapse and refractory AML patients, um, as an example, where we're studying our drug. drug. Yeah, I, I, I can't agree more. Um, now, so you are the CEO of glycomimetics. But I want to understand a bit more. What are the some key strategies and initiatives that you implemented as a leader in the field of oncology and at glycomimetics that have contributed to its success? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a you know, we're a very small company. Uh, I mean, as an example, uh, in 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 you know in Ibsen, I you know my team was you know 3,000 people wow. and, and of I had about you know seven or eight hundred people. Here I have less than fifty, you know. So <laughs> but still, that's a great were, number. That's a huge number, you know. Like, it, well, that's that's exactly where you know when I talk with pharma people, they say, "Oh, that's so small." When you know somebody like you would say, "Oh, that's actually much more than you know what." As a physician managers are. or like yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's all it's all relative, and it's I all agree. that's one of the challenges of you know also recruiting people from big pharma is we got to be careful is you're not going to find a department of fifteen people on a certain area. That is a great model in a bigger organization mm -hmm. where you can mm -hmm. really go deep, have all the in-house expertise mm -hmm. because you're mm -hmm. doing one you know one program after the other, so you, you're you have that common thread mm -hmm. between programs, but in a biotech, and especially a small one, a lot of it is about nimbleness, a lot of it is about, you know, a, a extending your cash runway as long as you can, while really making sure you're, you're advancing the things that matter. And I think that's probably the last part is really the, the most important part, but then it's the tougher thing to do, which is making choices between four or five great things that you can do but you got to be very strategic and you got to be able to gate things in a way I'm where you got to advance yeah. them. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. A lot of folks would say, yes, but they're all important. I'm like, I, I agree, but here's the thing, you know, we got to have, we got to move things forward as well. We can't just move, you know, five things, just one step. 
we got to be able to, you know, uh, keep multiple balls in the air, but also be clear on where our priorities are. Mm -hmm. So that that focus is very important. Uh, making sure you have the right people uh, working in the team, mm -hmm. but also uh, the right people who you can tap into from your environment. That's mm -hmm. another very important area is you don't have to have every role in the company, but you got to have good contacts of folks who you can lean into whenever need, whenever that is needed. So, uh, you know, and then I would say the third one is really the, 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 the cash runway, you know, but making sure investors, especially sophisticated ones who are very um, still very involved in the biotech industry um, that they really understand what the opportunity is. So I would say those are the three things really prioritization, the, the, the people aspect, internal and external, and then the value story to folks who are still active in this market and who really are looking to invest in novel therapies, uh, especially you know advanced ones and late stage ones like ours. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's something also like I'm learning I'm early in my career and uh, being a good leader also, like part of it is knowing what to delegate to who. And that's not an easy job. You can't do everything by yourself. Um, and that brings me maybe to the next question. Um, when you choose members to join your team or people to join your team, how do you choose them? And how do you think, okay, who should be where in this team? Especially like now you're working with relatively smaller teams. So I think you have more knowledge of your team members. So how do you put the right person in the right seat? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's really um, it's probably one of the most important things that as a CEO you do, especially in a smaller CEO. To be honest, I mean, we don't have an HR. We we had one at one point, but you know, as I said to the team, I am the HR head. You know, that's that's mm -hmm, really yeah. Cool yeah. as a CEO to make sure we're we're bringing in folks who, um, and it's a few different things. One is you know they clearly have to have a competence, especially technical competence in an area that we need. Right. I mean, these are high science areas. And if it's a um, if it's an area where there is certain technical expertise that is needed, you know, you got to have recent expertise. You can't learn that here on the job. You got to come with that. Uh, so that's that's kind of but, you know, first uh, cut. But to be honest, that's the easy part, because, you know, you can that, that you can see it from the resume, from a first, you know, kind of meeting with our our own technical experts as well. Um, what is really important is uh, how motivated is the person? Uh, how, how, do they understand what they're getting into? That's where I, I'm mm -hmm. very keen. Do they understand what the role is? And are they in on the story? And the last part is, will they play well with the rest of the team? You see? So, you know, the competencies part is it's probably the easiest to you know understand yeah um, it's, it's, it's motivation yeah. yeah you know like the motivation is really important like why why glycometrics not you know the xyz company yes like are you just looking for a job that's 10 minutes away from your house or are you really interested in joining a company that's about to change how um you know certain therapies are coming to the marketplace do you really want to be part of that and are you really world willing to be part of a team where you know we 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 have a model called positive tension? So uh, we don't want everybody to agree with each other all the time. That doesn't make sense because we're not going to be pushing the boundaries. At the same time, if it's chaotic uh, interactions, then we're also not going to move forward. So we got to be able to have that positive interaction where everybody is able to speak up, uh, feel comfortable enough that they can express their mind but they also know the rules of engagement is how do you build forward how do you stay positive how do you keep it on topic not on the person and you know so so my job is to ensure we are, first i'm providing that space for that conversation to happen be clear about the rules of engagement and then you know give give feedback to folks as they you know kind of maybe get close to that frame or 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 step behind you know about uh, outside of it and making sure as we we supplement the team members, we're really supplementing team members who are able to you know uh, uh, take our model and and thrive and and move forward with it. That's kind of where 
I spend quite a bit of my time, uh, you know, making sure it happens on a daily basis. When you hire people, like, do you put them like on, okay, so two weeks, we're going to try how things go or three or one month, we're going to try how things go and then we can decide or like you, when you interview people and you hire them, you already made that decision in your mind. So the moment we extend an offer to somebody, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I tell them I have 100% confidence in them as a person and in their ability to add value to our organization. Mm -hmm. We do not do the two weeks version or the three weeks version. You're either in or you're not in. There there are two categories. And, and, And when we give somebody, like I will literally tell them, I give you my trust from day one. And gotcha. sometimes people, what are you talking about? And but that's that's one of the models I've grown up with my mentors and, and with people who trusted me. And I know how that felt when somebody says, I trust you and I, you know, I will be there for you. This is your mm-hmm. role. Mm-hmm. I trust you're gonna do the job. I know how that felt, and I wanted to give 150% to that person, to that company. And I want to carry that uh, you know, what I learned forward. So that's that's the model we use. And at the same time, you know, we trust people, but we also hold them accountable. You know, the the trust does not mean blind trust. It just means we're all in the same equal field uh, from day one. It doesn't matter if I know somebody for five years or if I know you for five minutes. We've vetted you. We've done that uh, before we extended you an offer. So we do that step. Uh, But once we've done that, we're not, you know, continuously vetting you on a daily basis in your first two weeks. It doesn't work that way. Um, and, and on top of that, actually, we got some people to come in and, as consultants to say, look, if you're not sure, um, you know, consult with us for another month and then we talk, you know, sometimes yeah, we do that yeah, as well. Yeah. And um, and that's important because uh, as an example, you know, we hired one of, you know, a, a great uh, chief commercial officer uh, who I've known for, you know, 25 years, but we were, well, like, I was a chief commercial officer. He was a chief commercial officer. So, you know, it's like, how is that going to work? And I was very clear, oh, I'm no longer the chief commercial officer. That's not a role I want to do. But, you know, a lot of people say that, but then they, you know, end up micromanaging their their, their team yes. anyway. And then I said, <laughs> well, why don't you come in for a month and, you know, see how it works. And you know, if you, you know, if you like it, then we can talk. And that's what we did, you know. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a bit of uh, maybe uh, insights into how uh, how I like to be led and and the way I like to be led is is the way I lead. I can I can't agree more with that. Like when when we were talking, like you reminded me, and my grandma actually used to say like people rise to expectations. Um, so I think uh, you are right. Uh, uh, and then not micromanaging it's something. Uh, I think that's how you transition from a founder to a CEO. Um, talking about that, so y- you had lots of experience in the business world and making a difference uh, in healthcare and biotech. Uh, unfortunately, lots of physicians in medical school and when they become physicians, like we don't learn a lot on navigating the industrial, the business part of healthcare which can be complex. What advice do you have for physicians or other founders in the biotech space who are looking to make a meaningful impact on this space? Yeah, that's a great question, Rupen. And I, I mean, there are so many fantastic, you know, uh, medics and uh, and they're very good because they've been trained for many, many years in a very certain, you know, rigorous uh, program and certain ways. Um, and then sometimes they're thrown into the business world where it just it's a very different skill set. Um, exactly. And and sometimes I mean I, I know so many uh, amazing medics who've made that transition and uh, who are great leaders in in the sense of a, from a business perspective and you know went on, but others have not. And then you look at it and say, okay, what's the difference? Is it they both went to the same business uh, to the same uh, medical school? Exactly. So clear yeah. The medical. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, training, what, mm-hmm. what is it? And uh, a lot of it is really, you know, for me comes down to the openness and, you know, of, of knowing what you know and being humble enough to say, yes, in the field of medicine, I'm a great medic, 
in this area, you, you know, I, I got to I got to be humble enough to know who do I need to, to surround myself with? Yes. You know, how, how do I need to learn things? Um, because if, if, if the first thing that comes to your mind is I know that's a very uh, difficult uh, situation, because if you're in the frame of mind, I know you're not going to listen to anybody. Why would you? Because you already know. Right. So, you, you know, the best uh, medics that I've seen transition into great business leaders are ones who continuously worked on themselves. And I'm not just talking about like they went and got an MBA. Um, yes, that's helpful. Uh, but uh, I can tell you uh, that's not enough, you know, and you don't actually need one. It would be helpful to to have one because then you can understand the theoretical aspect and you, you will work on a lot of business cases from a business perspective. But a lot of it is around, uh, you know, having the humility and understanding of surrounding yourself with folks who complement your skill sets, uh, who make you a better, you know, uh, uh, biad or triad and being able to do that. And, and sometimes I've seen, you know, C CEOs who are, you know, medics and co-founding, and then they move into a CMO role or a CSO role. And I'm always kind of saying, you know, chapeau bas for these people that have the humility to say, I started it off, but now we need a professional CEO to take on, but I'm gonna be providing them the space for them to thrive. I'm not gonna be every day reminding them that I'm the, founder of the company or the co-founder you know so there's a lot of dynamics over there i, I would I, i'm i'm pleasantly surprised by many different uh, uh universities are now you know understanding this as well so offering additional business courses to uh to to physicians as they're part of their training but i think more more needs to be done and also on the real world uh, as i said uh, that 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 understanding of how do you continuously you know, improve and surround yourself with people better than you in areas that are needed. I think that's that's really you know the secret sauce. I can't agree more. I think as we become like physicians, or and we, we have this halo around us. If you understand everything, this we, we spent ten years. Yes, it's right. I spent ten years uh, in medical school and learning about the Krebs cycle and uh, the underlying pathophysiology of heart rate and like whatever but it's it, 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 it like you have to be very self-conscious and you have to know that you have so much blind spots when you go to a business meeting or you go, go to a meeting with other leaders in the space and like you just suddenly get surprised because like what what you know about medicine doesn't apply in many it, it doesn't translate that to executive skills in managing healthcare company and uh, i think finding me I'm, I'm still learning that like I'm, I'm i'm still struggling with okay so i don't know that it's okay the second year engineer who's been in data space and who has spent two years in school knows that part better than me and I'm, i spend like for for example 15 years of school that's fine it's okay it's okay to say i don't know even though I'm, i've been 15 years in school and I think it's something, uh, even though I struggle with, I think it's it's one of the most important things. Um, transitioning to a bit about the recent changes that have been happening in healthcare, um, I want to pick your brain uh, about uh, how do you see the intersection of technology, AI, and healthcare shaping the future of patient care, especially in the field of oncology? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm more excited than ever about the potential these new tools can provide us. I mean, that, that's kind of my big headline is, you know, we, we thought innovation was in a fast cycle 10, 20 years ago. I mean, it seems every decade it's, it's even faster and um, more multifaceted where you're able to combine multiple multiple different things under this big banner of, intersection of technology and and medicine now there are so many different aspects of technology you know ai being one of them and so many different aspects of medicine and it's not about like you know uh, two by two it's really about 10 by 10 20 by 20 kind of intersection so the complexity if you're afraid of complexity well you know tough luck because it is more much more complex, than, complex. than before 
and and if you're you know afraid of complexity and ambiguity, this is probably not the right industry for you anyway. But if you're if you're driven by you know what is possible, the question mm-hmm, of what mm-hmm. is possible, and um, you know different companies and different platform companies have the you know their own interrogation system of you know what if or, but the whole idea is that curiosity of if we combine this with that, what would happen? What are we trying to solve for? And and really staying with it um, and, and try to advance this, I think it's one of the best uh, times uh, for, for this uh, to happen. In fact, so much so that my daughter, who's, uh, who was asking me, like, what do we want to do? And uh, I took her with me to, to work. I, I've, I've done that over the years. Um, you know, she 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 went into biological sciences with an eye on uh, complementing it with technology as well in her studies. So you know, we believe in it uh, in this emergent household so much that now the second generation as well is is getting into that. Uh, so it's very exciting times, but it also it, it is a very complex time. The one thing I would just say is be careful of the the hypes. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of hype circles as well that happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you know, it's okay to be a bit skeptical. You know, I'm open to the to a technology and what it can do, but not just you know following the the trend because you know people around Oops. you are saying that it's Oops. important. So oh, that, 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 that that's what. I mean. uh, Mr. Har- oh, that's amazing. And um, talking about AI in healthcare, I, I can't agree more. Like healthcare is very complex. Um, Prescribing one medication, for example, if you're going to talk about the uh, the simplest unit, let's say I'm a physician, I'm going to prescribe a chemotherapy, for example, for a patient. Uh, it takes me, it takes pharmacist, it takes a, a dispensary unit, it takes a billing unit, it takes so many moving parts, it takes insurance to administer one chemotherapy to a patient. So healthcare is very complex and it's it's not a place where you can't deal with ambiguity and you can't deal with complexity um, because it, it's it's not easy space, but it's very exciting. Talking about the ex- excitement yeah. uh, in the space, um, what legacy do you hope to leave as a leader in the biotech industry? And how do you envision your contributions making a lasting impact on the field? Wow, that's a that's a big uh, question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, look, I, you know, I, I, for me, I, you know, I've been blessed with a, a career so far of, you know, almost 30 years and, and, and more to come, uh, doing something I love and, um, uh, you know, and making a good living at the same time. It's, it's, you know, there is a, if I look back to my college days, like, yeah, there is a lot of people who are smarter than me and, you know, you look at it and, you know, you always kind of say, oh, where a few different choices could have made the difference between one path versus the other. And um, for me, I'm very fortunate to be on a path where that, that curiosity, that, you know, self-drive um, um, has, has gotten the notice of mentors who believed in me, trusted in me, uh, you know, moved me forward, gave me opportunities from this, you know, uh, boy in uh, a sales rep and from Beirut, Lebanon to, you know, to, to be heading a uh, uh, large organization. So I'm very blessed and humbled and I never forget that that journey. So a lot of it is all, all about giving back. You know, a lot of my time is about, you know, mentorship, uh, spending time with, you know, the, the, the new generation. Um, and um, if people can, could believe with me and then especially when, you know, as a young boy, how, Brash I was, uh, but uh, <laughs> you know it's it's really something where I want to give back, and I do that on a daily basis. So really, the legacy, obviously, on the business side, I mean, I've been fortunate to have launched you know twenty plus therapies, especially in oncology, hematology, wow. touch the life of patients. Um, you know, I remember one of the first imatinib patients back in the day when I was the global head for for imatinib Gleevec. Um, you, you know, the, 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 the gentleman was a, you know, young, uh, German guy who didn't know if he was going to live or not. And until, you know, he could see how the world of chronic myelogenous leukemia has changed. And now he was, he was, you know, going to live. Um, and then the next questions came is where him and his wife were, 
were thinking about having a child and does he stop his, you know, life-saving therapy because, you know, Gleevec has a teratogenic effect as well. Does he stop it enough for, for them to get pregnant and have a kid? I mean, that was a, such a change in the conversation. And then, you know, a year later when I, you know, met him again, they, they had a beautiful young, you know, small girl um, in their hands. So you could see that journey. So these are things like I never will forget in my life, you know, in terms of the impact on yeah. patients yeah. side, but also on the on the talent side where when somebody says, you know, remember, I used to be part of your team. I still remember what you said on this day for me. You know, last week, somebody from Canada said we had a conversation in an elevator in 2015. I don't know if you wow. remember. I'm like, I, I cannot say I do, but um Hopefully it was a good one. <laughs> you know, he said, well, <laughs> eight years later. I'm... So those are the two things really that drive me is those patient stories, the people we impact. Uh, ultimately, that's why we're here for. And and also in the way the friends that you make, the camaraderie, the respect of, of folks who, you know, I look up to my mentors and people look up to me. So I, I take that uh, very, very seriously and make sure that I'm living, you know, and, and being the leader that that they think I am uh every day so those th that that would be part part of my you know hopefully part of my legacy one day uh when that day comes thank you so much like this this has been really an enlightening uh interview i i, I learned a lot and that's what i love about interviewing people and learning from experience and thank you so much for sharing all these details about your life and your leadership and your companies and um, i'm sure that uh you left lots of legacy and you're still li living legacy for the upcoming people. And like, it's, it's, it's so exciting for me. Like when you are talking about these therapies, like uh, CDK46 or imatinib or Gleevec, like those are things I use in daily basis in the clinic. And it's so nice to talk to the people who were able to, who were part of introducing this to the market. It's, it's, it's amazing. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Rupen.